Hi, my name is Gary Hodges. I'm the creator of Dinosaurs vs. Mars Bots, and I wrote a comic book. Welcome back, everybody. Video 6. Spooky, you are not a part of this video. No. No. Okay, maybe a little bit. Okay, okay. I'm sorry. So, to recap, uh, last time we talked about drawing. Just drawing page after page after page. So, what's left? This is the odds and ends video. This is everything else. Um, so once I finished page 40, the first thing I did was nothing. Absolutely nothing. I was so exhausted. I saved everything. I backed everything up to my Google Drive. And I hightailed it to Flagstaff uh, to just take a weekend to myself to decompress. I ate a lot of pizza. I drank a lot of alcohol. I sat in the hotel tub quite a bit. I think I ate a caramel apple. I just unwound. I just decompressed. It was my first weekend completely off for, you know, almost, it had been almost a year. So I got, ate that up. That was amazing. After that, I came home. I did not look at it. Still, gave it a few more days. And then I began looking through all the pages, one by one, to create a list of edits and revisions, like a to-do list. Things that I wanted to tweak before I called these pages absolutely 100% done forever, no take backsies. I was looking for two sorts of things when I was um, going through everything I'd drawn. Obviously, I'm looking for mistakes or things that I think just didn't look quite right, things I thought I could take another pass set to make them look better. Uh, but also I was looking to adjust for what I've been shorthanding as drift. Drift being how I draw something on week one is going to look different than how I was drawing something at week 40. Like if you're drawing every weekend over and over and over for 40 weeks, it's it just starts to look a little different as you go on. You, you have a different idea of how you think how you think things should look. You start refining your process a little bit and shorthanding a lot of things. There's just all sorts of little changes that you're not even aware that you're you're making as you're going on. So what I needed to do, really, most of all, when I was looking at the 40 pages I had drawn, is made sure that this looks relatively consistent. I didn't want it to look like, if you've ever seen old Garfield, like the original Garfield comics, uh, what Garfield looked like compared to Garfield today. Now, and that was over years and years and years with, uh, with Garfield. But even over 40 weeks drawing the same thing over and over and over, it, I'm going to just start drawing things a little bit differently as time goes on. And I didn't want that to be too dramatic. So a lot of my edits were concentrated mostly on those first five or six pages where I was still sort of getting my sea legs and still even just getting into the, the rhythm of like, okay, I'm drawing a comic every weekend. Once I officially locked down all my pages, I'd done all my updates, my revisions, my tweaks, cleaned everything up, felt like everything could look as good as it could look, given time constraints, given my level of ability, given, 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 given. Then what? Then I had to do what I described in a past video as all the ancillary content. So here is the comic. This is one I'm keeping for myself because there was some, I think the technical term is schmutz on the cover. Uh, so I'm keeping this one. This will be my demo. If I'm at a comic con and I want to put one out for people to handle, this will probably be the one since it's already a little grubby. There's story pages. Ooh, we don't want to give away too many spoilers. but. Um, story pages. But before you get into the story, there's a copyright page, naturally, which doesn't seem like much, but after you've drawn 40 pages, you're just, you're not feeling it. You're not in the mood, but you're, you, it's like, all right, I'll do a copyright page. So how, what, what needs to be on there? What fonts? What's the layout going to look like? 
Then I have my version of a thank you page, which I mentioned in, I think, a previous video. This is the in-universe leaked document, government talking about accessories to my crime of leaking top secret information in the form of a comic book. I had to do the introduction, which I mentioned in the writing video. I think that would have been video two. The function of the introduction, as I mentioned way back then, was I'm going to read the comic and I'm going to try and think if I don't know anything about dinosaurs versus Mars bots, and even further, if I've never even read a comic book before, what information do I need to hit the ground running once I start reading this story and not be confused or lost or whatever? So in one way, it's you're starting with the storytelling and you're trying to get a tone and you're trying to get a feel and, and you're, you're trying to um, get people in the mindset of the story you're about to present. On the other hand, you also have a mission. Afterward, there is a faux news article. I wanted the, the, the cover story that the government would have put out to explain away events of the, the story. This was actually fun to research. I actually went and got the newspaper from this day and date and found a page where I felt like I could basically splice in my story, my, my made up article. But it was fun to look at the old ads from that day and what articles, you know, were in the paper, what people were talking about. And then on the final page, there's a future leaks, AKA uh, stories to come, comics to come giving a little bit of a tease of like there, you know, there are more stories to tell, not just 1975. After that, perhaps one of the more important things was the cover. I had to do a cover. Initially, my thoughts for the cover were it would look very similar to the art inside, but just in color. And once I got done with everything, I wasn't feeling that. I wasn't into it because I had done the interior art for so long. I, I just, I felt like I wanted the cover to be different. I wanted to change it up somehow. But at the same time, I didn't want to give much away. I wanted the cover to be ambiguous. Once, it, those of you who are going to read the comic, once you get it, you'll see it is a comic you can spoil by giving away too much information, which is part of why I've been very careful about showing pages and showing too much from it. There are little twists and turns that I don't want you to anticipate, which limits what I can show in the promotion of it and also limits what I can do with the cover because generally speaking, comic covers show some sort of uh, action beat or twist or something from the story and I don't want to give any of those away on the cover. So it was tricky. So I knew it needed to be a little bit more abstract, a little bit more stylized, a little bit more stylish. Uh, so I started for inspiration I started looking at, because I'm a, a little bit of a movie nerd, I started looking at Criterion Collection covers because I thought they thread that needle pretty well most of the time. They, they can give a mood of the movie but they're very designery. It's more about colors and shapes, and, and it doesn't give a lot away. I wanted something like that. I think this might have been more or less my first idea, like the first picture I had in my head of, well, what could it look like? And I pictured something like this. The thing that took longest was getting this blood slash cloud effect to look right. Uh, at first, it was very painterly and very, very... Um, uh, graphic symbolic. It didn't really necessarily even look like blood. It, it suggested blood because it was red and it was splattery, but it looked more like you just took a brush and went like whoosh and just made like an egg shape with kind of messy edges. But when I showed that to a few people to see like, what do you think? Like it wasn't overwhelmingly positive. Like there are a lot of people like, I don't know, it just kind of looks like a red shape. So that's when I started experimenting with different brushes in Photoshop and trying to come up with something that looked a little splattery. Uh, a little more like a stain and you know ended up with what I have which I'm happy with I like how that looks and that was it I had everything I had no more excuses now I had to get it printed 
Uh, as I mentioned in the proof review video, I went with Comics Wellspring. Uh, they did a great job with it. Uh, prices seem reasonable to me. Unfortunately, I can't order the volume I need to to make it really a bargain to print because I I can't order a thousand comics. And I didn't do a Kickstarter or anything to fund printing. It's all out of my pocket. So I had to do a relatively small run. And also, I have no idea how this is going to go. I mean, it might, I might sell just a few here and there until Comic-Con next year, so I wasn't going to order 500. I was going to order a few and see see how it goes. And uh, I think that's it. I tried to blaze through this one. I tried to just hit bullet points because, as I mentioned, I think in the previous video or maybe the one before that, I have a mountain of questions that came in through the Survey Monkey that I want to address. And I was hoping I can just cover the last of getting the comic made and try and knock out a bunch of these. So for the last video, I can talk about the future, like what now. And there's one last giant question that I wanted to answer that it, it, the answer is sort of a story. So I wanted to give myself lots of room to tell it. So I didn't want to do it in this one. So that's the plan right now. I'm going to try and bust through. I've got a list. I printed up all the questions that I haven't answered yet. I'm going to try and just burn through them. And the next time, that'll be the topic. The future, what now, and story time with Gary. Here we go. So when can we buy the comic already? Well, a few people have asked this. It's been hanging out for a while. And I haven't been answering it because I didn't know what to tell you because I didn't know when it was going to be. Uh, available to buy. Well, now I do. I have comics uh, sitting out in my living room. I sent off the first few today to helpers, people I had promised a free one because they had read a draft or post for pictures or whatever, so those are going out. Now, I would say when you're watching this, comics will be available to buy in my Etsy shop sometime this week. You're not going to miss it. It's not going to sneak by you. Believe me, there'll be posts and there'll be on the Instagram, on the Facebook, on, on everywhere. There might even be a little tiny, tiny video on YouTube just saying like, hey, comics available now, whatever. But this week, this week comics will be available. Question number two, are there any deeper meanings or messages or symbolism in the comic? Yes. Question number three. What's the video plan once these are all done? Are you going to keep vlogging with two, uh, two question marks? So I guess they really want to know. Uh, not like I am now, not as frequently. Right now I'm doing one to two videos a week. I will not be doing one to two videos a week. I will probably do a video anytime there is something worth vlogging about. So at the absolute latest, I would expect there will be vlogs running up to Phoenix Comic Con Fan Fest Fusion, whatever they're calling it. Um, because I thought that might be interesting to a lot of you, just to see what goes into going to the convention. It's a lot of work. It's There's all this stuff that you probably never thought of. And it's fun. And it'd be fun to do some videos, maybe even some live videos from the show floor. So that would be the absolute latest. Question number four. Walk us through all the art you have up on your walls in the background. What a creeper. Okay. We'll go from left to right. Um, and then from top to bottom. Uh, the first thing you see when, in my, where I normally frame the camera is the make more art uh, print that I just have pinned up. I picked that up at a, a letterpress thing at ASU um, a few years ago. It's just my little reminder to myself. I just, wherever, wherever my little work area is, wherever I happen to be living at the time, I usually pin that up where I can see it and just constantly be reminded. Next is my eco print. If you're a gamer, you know what eco is, I-C-O. That is a painting by Fumitu Ueda, I think I is how you say his last name. I don't know. I don't speak Japanese, but I think it's something like that. I've just always loved it. It's sort of, I don't know. It just, it just gets me in the feels. There's something, I like the, the strange 
sort of dreamlike quality of the landscape. I like the loneliness of the two characters. I, I relying on each other. There's just something kind of romantic and and dream logic-y and moving about it to me, and I'm not sure why. But you don't really need to know why, do you? You just need to know that you like it. Next is uh, The Treachery of Images by Magritte, one of my favorite paintings. I could probably do a whole vlog talking about why I love that and, and analyzing it and talking about Magritte, but I'm not going to. If you're interested, though, you should absolutely Google and look them up. Uh, beneath that, I have William Blake's Cain and Abel. In it, we see Cain fleeing uh, with uh, the, that red orb represents, I think, God's accusing eye after he has murdered uh, his brother Abel and Adam and Eve have discovered their dead son. I've always liked William Blake's work and I've always especially liked that one. And then the last is Agaricus Livia by a little known artist by the name of Gary Hodges. It was an illustration I did I think for an art project when I was at Mesa Community College and it went, it went to the student art show, which I know student art show, maybe that doesn't mean a lot to a lot of people, but it meant a lot to me. I was sort of proud of myself and it was going to be the first image in a series. I had a whole project in mind. One of the projects that I was alluding to in a previous video, I was going to do a series of these strange creatures with the whole story behind it. And I'm not going to go too far into it because I might still do it someday and I don't want to spoil it. So those are the prints and pictures and everything you can see in frame. Weird, creepy stalker. Question five. When are you going to take me to dinner or respond to my texts, jerk face? Well, never, if that's the kind of tone you're going to take. Question number six. So you finished the comic. What next? What projects are in the works? Actually, I shouldn't have read that, because we're going to talk about that next time. Question number seven. What goals did you have when you started your comic? Now that it's done, how would you score yourself? Wow. Um, goals I had when I started the comic. I wanted to do something a little different. I wanted to do something that was true to my own voice and my ideas of what would be a fun story to tell. I wanted to draw it in a way that looked neat to me. And I wanted to avoid, I think everyone does this when they're trying to do something creative, no matter what it is, comics, writing, painting, making movies, making music, whatever it is. Sometimes it's a rebuttal to other crap you see. And there's a lot of things I see in comics that just bug me that I've always thought, if I do a comic, I'm not going to do that, whatever it may be. Uh, I feel like I avoided a lot of those sort of tired comic tropes that I don't love to see. Question number eight. I think eight. One, two, three, four. Where did you get that alien figure? I want one. I'm assuming you mean this guy. Uh, unfortunately, I can't really help you out. This is a old tester's model kit that I actually built and painted I put this together when I was a kid, and it's just somehow miraculously survived every move uh, all this time. I'm sure you can find kits on eBay if you really, really want one. Yeah, I mean, like I said, it's a model kit. You'd have to glue it together and paint it, but it's not difficult. I mean, it's not like putting together a plane or, or something. It's nine pieces, maybe <laughs> ten. It's not hard. I'm glad you like them. I like them, too. That's why I've kept them all this time. Question number nine. How about selling limited edition 3D printed Dinosaurs vs. Mars Bots characters? That sounds awesome. Alas, I am not a great 3D modeler. Especially not for, you know, dinosaurs and like organic kind of things. I'm pretty good when it comes to the stuff I have to 3D model at work. Knives, guns, crime scenes, furniture, things like that. But if it came to aliens and dinosaurs and things, I... I I, there are people who are much, much, much better than that, and I don't want to pay them to do it. Now, on the topic of limited edition stuff, I do have ideas for things that I want to bring to Comic-Con next year uh, that will be limited or con uh, 
convention exclusive, maybe. I haven't decided yet, but we will talk about that next video. Guys, that's it. Just blaze through it this time. I think, you never know. It's tough. One of the things I'm learning about this vlogging business is you can feel like, I barely talked. This is going to be the shortest video ever. And then you start editing it together and no. And then other times you think, oh my god, that just never ended. This is going to be terrible. And you start editing it and it's like, oh no, I only talked about like 15 minutes or something. We'll see. But I tried to get that one out fast. Next video in about a week. Last video in about a week. <gasps> but sometime before then, an announcement that comics were on sale and where to get them and how to get them. It's happening. <sighs> All right, guys. I want to finish my wine. I want to start cobbling this video together to get it up as fast as I can. That sounded weird, right? Get it up as fast as I can. Have I had too much wine? I better just bail now. I will talk to you next time. The distant future, the year 2000. The distant future, the year 2000. The distant future, the distant future. It is the distant future, the year 2000. We are robots. The world is quite different ever since the robotic uprising of the late 90s. There is no more unhappiness. Affirmative. We no longer say yes. Instead, we say affirmative. Yes, affer uh, affirmative. Unless we know the other uh, robot really well. There is no more unethical treatment of the elephants. Well, there's no more elephants, so... Uh, but still, it's good.